Um, just a little bit of introduction. My name is Ina Rudino, and I am the online learning librarian. So I'm a full-time librarian here on campus, but my assignment is to the online department. So that's me. And we also have Bruce Olson with us, and he is a full-time librarian here on campus as well. And he works um, for public services. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. Come on in. Help yourself. Um, so I wanted to start out today by asking if there's any questions about any resources or anything that the library does, um, anything like that, because I'd like to direct it to you and to your questions and the things that you would like to see from the library. Go ahead. I think I mentioned it before, the interlibrary loan. Okay. I had trouble accessing that. I didn't know that ID was something I didn't have or didn't have. It should okay. just be your EYUI on the login credentials. Yeah, right now. Okay. And if that doesn't work, um, call the interlibrary loan office and they can just. But I guess happening? to that question, assuming I can get in, then what kinds of things can you borrow from where? If we're off site. Can you actually physically go to another university library? Chris will take you through the whole online <laughs> interlibrary library loan. Yes. <laughs> okay, so let's just start at the beginning, okay? First of all, BYU Idaho faculty and students are entitled to interlibrary loan. That's one thing that we want to make clear is we try and make the online experience for students as close to the on campus experience as we can. It's not always possible to be identical, but we try and do as good as we can. Interlibrary loan, what that means is if there are students that need an article to deliver to them, we're happy to go get that from another library and deliver it to them. Most of our resources are available electronically, the, uh, the article resources, and so it's easy for them to access those themselves. But if there is something that they need that we don't have access to, they can submit an interlibrary loan request and we'll get that to them. Books are a little bit of a different story because of the shipping costs involved with that. We haven't got it so that we're able to do that yet for students or faculty. However, if there's, there are online students close enough to Rexburg that they want to come to campus and pick up a book, they can do that. We'll interlibrary loan it in, we'll send them an email when it's here, they can come get it and use it for three weeks and then they can take it back, or drop it back off to us and we'll ship it back. So that's the what. We try and get everything we can. If there's a book that an online student or faculty member needs that's not, that we don't, let's see, that isn't close to Rexburg, we will try and look for that and see if we can purchase an online version of that so that they can get that. However, there's a lot of books Books haven't caught up with articles in the electronic world yet, and so there are a lot of books that we can't get electronically. So let me show you what we're going to do for interlibrary loan. We're just going to search for something using this main library search box. And when you search for something, you're going to get a bunch of results. And just for the purposes of the demonstration, I'm going to limit it in a couple of ways. The first thing I'm going to do is just go to the scholarly resources so that we're looking mostly at articles, because that's what you're going to be dealing with most often. So what did you just say? I'm sorry. You like gold. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> it's one of those things that I think I understand it, so everybody should be right with me. I'm going to come right down here, where it says scholarly and peer-reviewed journals. So we're going to limit it that way, so that we get rid of all the books, we get rid of all the newspapers, magazines, and everything else. And then I'm going to limit it one other way, so that I can get to this, and that way is we're going to eliminate this option right here that says available in the library collection. And so that'll allow us to look for things that we don't have access to at BYU. So when I do this, and I come scroll down, what I'm always kind of hoping to see is this PDF full text, because then you've got the article right there, you don't have to worry about it, you go and you click it and you've got it. If you come down a little bit further here, we've got this find full text option right here. That means that this is something that isn't being searched in this resource. What we're searching here is we're searching the library catalog and about 50 different databases simultaneously. And so it's looking through all of those at the same time. Sometimes we're not going to have access to those. So what we'll see is this find full text link. If you click on that, it's going to ask you to log in. And this should, again, just be your BYU-Idaho information. 
And then what we're going to get here is it's going to say that we don't have this full text anywhere. And so it'll say no text found online. Please try the other options below. The other options below are interlibrary. So from here, if I just click on request document via, this will bring me to our interlibrary loan page where you can log in and get access to that. So if I click, but using again my login, maybe I can't get into it either. What this will then do, your first time in, it'll ask you for information. It'll ask you for your address, your I number, other things like that, so that we can get a hold of you if there's a problem with the request. But after that, what should happen is it should import all the information you need for that with request. This one hasn't included the volume or the issue or the year, so we'll have to go back and get that. And then we come down here and click Submit Request. Pretty basic there, and then you wait. The process is that if we don't have it, which we probably don't at this point, this will go down to BYU. BYU's library is just a little bit larger than ours by about five million things, so there's a <laughs> chance that they're going to have it. If they do have it, they'll pull it off the shelf and they'll scan it and post it to a server. They'll send an email out with instructions on how to access that. So in the email, you'll click the link. Basically what it'll do is take you back to the interlibrary loan login screen. You'll log in again and your article will be there waiting for you. So will you get an email when that's in? You will get an email. If BYU has it, that's generally about two to three days that that'll take. So it's not quite instantaneous yet. But depending on where they are in their cycle of doing things, I've gotten one as fast as two hours before. So if you did it just right, you might get something quicker than a couple of days. Um, books are similar in that, oops. If you come to the library homepage and click on enter library one here, this will take you again to the same login screen. But since we're doing a book, we actually have to come here and click on book and then fill out the information. Same process happens. It'll go down to BYU. If they have it, they'll get it and ship it to us FedEx. So it'll be here usually three to five days is what we say for that. Um, if BYU doesn't have these things, what they'll do is they'll send it out nationwide and they'll find somebody that has it for us. It usually increases the wait time by a couple of days, but we're still usually able to get so if we live closer to BYU Provo, mm -hmm. do we have access to the library there? Can, instead of having them ship it up to here, can we just go down and look at it? Yeah, actually you do. Oh. Yeah, so as a faculty member of BYU-Idaho, we're part of a consortium with the other church libraries. So BYU-Hawaii, if you're in Hawaii, you can go there too. <laughs> so, LDS Business College and BYU. And so you should be able to go to their circulation desk, give them your... BYU Idaho iCard. Do y'all have iCards? No. no. If we're not, that's what we need. Yeah. You need an iCard. I mean, you should be able to. Do y'all have iNumbers? Yes. You have our numbers in your profile, yeah. but you don't actually have a physical card. You should be able to go there and give them your iNumber and receive privileges, but I'm going to have to check on that because that's probably something we've never dealt with before. <laughs> that would be so funny. Uh, yeah. yeah. I did right. Plus, yeah, so why have us do it you can do it. Any journals, obviously you can go down and do that yourself, yeah. but books we'll have to check on and see. But yeah, that is something that... But you're here today, you could go and get an iCard, it's really easy. You can. Yeah. 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 yeah, you should be able to go over to the Kimball building and get an iCard. Yeah. The Kimball building. Right that way. It's right behind us. Okay. Yeah. It's east. Uh -huh. And it's down on the first floor, actually in the... The accounting office, the bursar's office, it's, is that right? Yeah, that's where it's one of those weird things that you wouldn't think of being there, but there oh, it is. Why it was there, but it is. And they take you pictures. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and they give you a copy right there. Let me write that down so I know to check out. Okay. Um, cool thing about interlibrary loan, there's no charge to it. It's part of the tuition cost, and so, but because of that, there is a charge that we incur. It's usually about eighteen to twenty dollars per request, and so because of that, we ask that all requests actually be academic in nature rather than requesting the most novel to read a movie that you want to watch. <laughs> so, there's interlibrary loan. Questions? Did that answer? Other than getting you in, it, I was able to do it. Now. You are okay. awesome. We fixed your problem. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was I am. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'd like to learn about turning in and how we can use our students. Okay. Um, Is that me again? Do you want to do it? Uh, I've, I've used it as a student, but never as a. Okay. Yeah, do you want to do that one or do you want me to? Okay. <laughs> so did y'all get one of these? This is the turn it in handout. I've been on there and I get On this, we have the university access code. So if you log in and associate yourself with BYU Idaho, you'll need that code. Um, there are a few things with this that are really cool. Turnitin is often thought of as the tool that we use to catch people that are plagiarizing, right? That's great, it works that way. However, one thing that we like to do is we like to open Turnitin up to our students prior to them handing in materials so they can see if they're doing something incorrectly. So they can see, submit their paper, they can see where it would say, okay, this is where you've forgotten to put a citation or whatever so that they can fix that so when it comes to you, it's not going to have that problem. There are people that will use that in a way that's probably not the best because they'll use it to further enhance the way they're doing it, but that's, that's them, not us. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to the library homepage again, and you're going to go to turn it in on the right-hand side right here. And I'll admit very freely that I am not an expert at turn it in in any way, shape, or form. Um, I've used it a little bit, and I'm trying to remember what I used for my login. <laughs> okay, so when you log in, you're going to have some different options. You've got a dashboard here that will allow you to, to start in a few ways. Here it shows all of my things that I've got in here. Um, I can go to all classes and it will show me what to do. What you're going to need to do to start is go to the join account. And then on this handout, is this online for anybody that might be watching us? Um, John will get it online. We'll put this online for anybody that's there in camera land. Um, and we have the account ID and the join, join password. So you'll enter that here. Then you can come to all classes, and you need to create a class for your students to go to. So we'll go to add class right here. And when I do this, it's going to ask me a couple of things. I think that we'll all, I'm not sure what the difference between standard and master is here, so I'm just going to leave it as standard. Class name, we'll just do demo or don't. Enrollment password. This is a password that you create that you'll give your students so that they can join the class. So we'll again just say this is test. And then for some reason, it makes you select your subject areas. I'm not sure why it does that, why it won't let you do it without. And it also makes you select your student level. So we'll go with undergraduate. And then you choose an ending date for this class. So it'll give you something by default here. You can change that or you can keep what's there. And then we click Submit. And now it tells me I've got a class that's created. You'll want to take note of this class ID here, because again, your students will need that in order to join the class. And then it tells you your password. Okay? So there is that. You'll give that information to your students, and they'll be able to come to that same login, create an account, and then join the class. I'm trying to think. Should I, do you want to see that, how that'll work for them? Or do you just want to see your side of things? You want to see that? Yeah, the students will go there. Um, let me see. So they'll log in. I've got a student account. And again, I should have looked at this more closely. Okay. Anyway, when they log in, what they'll get is something that will ask them which class they're going to join. They'll put in the password and the, the class ID, and it'll bring them to that class. They'll be able to upload a paper, and there it'll give them a lot of the same options it gives you as a faculty member. It'll give them the report that shows them how much they've plagiarized. Um, it'll show them where it comes from so that they can identify, well, maybe I got this. Uh, who knows? So it'll show them things. 
basically what it'll look like is, let me go to here. I've got one submission to this. Oh, you'll have to add an assignment for them so that they can do that. Same sort of thing. It's a paper assignment, next step. Or you can have them do things where they grade each other's papers. Um, when I, more actions, let's see. Paper, come on, let's hear something. View. Then this one shows me I've got 14% similarity here. I click on it, it comes in and tells me what's similar. So actually, this is kind of funny because this is an article that I use in one of the classes that I teach that is actually just from a book. We have a copyright clearance under our copyright clearance license. And so it should actually say there's 100% similarity here, <laughs> but it only shows that there's 14. So what happens here is it tells you this, this little paragraph has been copied. So you can click on three, and it will show you where in this option it came from so that you can show students that. Over here on this side, it says that number three, there's 3% of this paper that comes from this other resource. You can do the same thing. So if we go to number one, here it shows me this sentence, and it tells me that there's 7% of that that came from another group. It's not just online, right? Like it's from books that everything. Books, any other paper that's been submitted to this, it looks at that. So there are billions of resources in here by now that it's checking against. Obviously, sometimes there will be phrases that it catches that are normal phrases that everybody uses. The other thing that it catches is it catches well-documented citations. So even if they put that in-text citation in the paper and footnoted it properly, it'll still highlight that as text that comes from somewhere else. But with the citation, you can then say, okay, that's fine, and bypass it. What's acceptable? 14% acceptable? Well, that all depends on you. Um, it depends. I think one thing to remember that if the paper is very well documented, there may be some accidental plagiarism that happens there, unintentional plagiarism. And if that happens, then it might be, you, you could point that out and say, okay, this comes from another source, don't forget to cite all of your resources. If there's 80 or 90% of plagiarism on the paper, then you're pretty confident that, that it's there. One thing that we did, this was with you, Christina, that I did, I think. When I was working on, um, working to help build a, a course, let me see, I want my classes. I think it's this one. This was a health science class, no, that's not it. We did this for a health science class and there were some things that we were looking at to see if we could identify where they came from. It wasn't that we were testing for plagiarism, we knew that they weren't ours, we just needed to resource them properly and, and see that way. Um, what did I just click on? I did all some questions. Okay. So I used this and I could find the resource where it came from easier than anything else. Rather than trying to find it on my own, I throw it in to turn it in and it says, okay, this all came from here. But here's here you can see there are some that hundred percent from somewhere else. When you click on it, it shows you exactly where it came from. And it's really nice and easy. Okay, the other thing that's nice about this is it does have, oh, there's the originality report. Everything's right. The other thing that you can do here is you can help grade things in this area. So it has a grade mark function, and that, it'll automatically put some things in there, but if you find that there's something that's a weak transition, you can drag that over to the area in the paper and drop it in, and it'll, it'll work on that for you. So I'm not a big understander of this. Yes, Matt, Stacy. So I'm just wondering if you can grade in here, and I guess I'm just wondering how it coincides with iLearn. It doesn't. No. They do not talk to each but other. But they're going to, I hear. Oh, really? In, with the new iLearn? Yeah. Okay. And they, I heard that yesterday, and I'm like, okay. That's <laughs> That'll make it easier, yeah. yeah. So in the meantime, um, if we use it for our students, like, can we require our students to use it? Or? You can, yeah. If you want to require them to submit it here, you can. Or you can actually, because you're all receiving papers electronically, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's, a, if there's a certain paper that you have a question about, you can create your own class. Let me see. And then you can come here and you can submit something yourself. 
So you can oh, okay. save it and drop it in there and check and see, oh, okay, that person didn't do what I thought. So instead of requiring it for everything, if there's one that looks fishy, yeah, just you just take their paper and check it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions about Turnitin that I can't answer? <laughs> All right. Other questions? Um, it, how would you, what would you recommend for an online student to learn what's available to them? If, do you have any on, like brief tutorials um, other than just sending them to the website? So what's available to them? It's kind of like a, you know, like a tour of what's available to them. Um, that's a really great question. And one reason why we're happy that you're here is obviously you as their instructor, the more you know, the more that you can help them understand. We're here as librarians to help them understand as well. Um, so there's always this ask a question right here. It's kind of hidden on the side. You see it. And that pulls out a chat box and you can go on and ask. I'm supposed to be on, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's offline because Chris is here, not <laughs> online right now. So normally this is on or you can, you know, type it in here and it'll search to see if the question's already been asked. You can ask via email or text as well. Okay, so that's something that's available to them, and we'll try to get back to them as soon as possible if we're not online. There's also this tutorials button right here. Can you yeah. see that? Yeah. And this pulls up a whole list of tutorials. Um, a lot of them are specific to databases. The front page might be the same because we've changed how our front page looks. But once they're actually in the resource, it should be quite similar to that. Okay, so you can scroll down. Um, we do have kind of a little tour of the library that we're looking at getting on here. And it's not the library, I mean, by the library, I mean the library website. Okay, then. so it'll show you um, this page and some of these functions right here, and it has a short little description about each one. Okay, so you can have that. We also have um, the research guides right here, and they can be specific to your course. If you don't have one, you can ask for one. And I'm not sure if online has a process for that, but um, we will definitely be able to create them. There's an online section right here, and there's an online um, library resource for online instructors here. And that's on my card, so if you have my card, it'll take you directly to that page. And then um, you can see there's some specific classes here. I'm gonna show you the one that, um, for biology, this is one where we're still, still working process, but has a specific search bar just for biology here. Okay, there's Google Scholar and a video that shows them how to use Google Scholar and a Google Scholar search box right here. Okay, and then there's videos that talk a little bit more about research. And then we try to put in articles and books specific to that topic. So this, this is evolution. So most of these have to do with evolution or basic science. Okay, so um, it, I understand it's harder for students online to learn about this. But if they have questions, just tell them don't be afraid to ask. They can ask you, you can come to me as the online librarian, um, or you can go to the specific subject librarians as well. Yes? Um, well, I mean, if we become familiar with this and how it relates to our course, we can just create a short video and post it for all of our students to sure. see for exactly yeah. what applies to our course. Yeah. So they can just watch a short five-minute video showing every, you know, the top resources available for your class. Right. You can also, um, you know, and this is one thing we want you to be aware of, so if you're making videos, I just clicked on all A to Z. This is all of our databases, but you can limit it by subject over here on the left hand side. Okay, so what was it you, you teach? Uh, healthcare. Healthcare, so, so health sciences. Yeah, so health sciences. So maybe something under nursing, maybe physical sciences. We don't actually have a just a health one, but you could um, try to limit those to find You can out. use that search bar underneath the top one. Right yeah, here. right there, and search for health sciences there, and it'll bring up all the databases. So you can see it's limiting it while I'm typing. Yeah, that's uh, so just stop at health. Yeah, maybe just stop at health right there. Okay. Um, one other thing. So this right here on the left, our quick links, is our subject librarian box. So pull, I'm right there at the top. So as long as you can get to our home page and go to subject librarians, you can always find us. And then. Um, these are the different subject librarians for some of the subjects right there. If you click on it. So is your email? Yeah. Okay. Email, phone number, office number. And where's all the textbooks that we have access to? Okay, so those are generally they're ebooks. So they're not going to be 
just under a certain section. So where do you find them? So if you want to find like, what's your text? Oh, I see. So you just have to type it in. Well, yeah. Or you can go. The course will have it. Yeah, they'll have a link to it if we have it. Oh, so you should we have like a life, I mean, a site of all the textbooks and which class? No, because when they're creating the course, they'll come and ask us if we have access to it. And if they do, if we do or can get it for them, then they'll put the link in the course. We use, can I see how it works? Ancestral Trails? Okay. Right. Trail? Uh -huh. Trails. Trails. <laughs> so this is a book right here. You yeah. can see it's here. Uh -huh. So um, you can come over here and limit it by source types. We'll just do the books. That yeah, I'm not seeing that. Do you know that you have an electronic version? No, I don't. I think I think they'd buy it, but I can't remember. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is the closest one. Yeah, storage. <laughs> but if it was available, that's how they would use it. And okay. it would, yeah, it would actually they put a link inside of your course so students would have to. Yeah, students would have to search. Oh, right, they have a link, so that's why I didn't know how this worked. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so, so there is that. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Are there any other questions about that? We have a couple more minutes. So um, they said we could go a little bit over since we started a little bit late. So I wanted to show you a couple fun things about the library. Okay, because we're not just all academic. We are, but we have fun things too. Okay. So the first one is this swank right here. These are our kind of most popular things on these slider bars right here. These are databases. Obviously, these are. These are videos and languages. So Swink is our, which is not going to work. Is it Chrome? I thought we went there. So one thing to remember, all of these resources did have to start out as academic requests. So yes. Swink is a database of 300 feature films that we have access to. And it started out just as there were a lot of faculty members needing feature films. And so we went and we licensed those all individually. And the cost was so great that when they came out with this option that we could triple the number of videos that we have for about the same price, we decided it was pretty good. Wow. So we decided that we'd go get some fun movies that, that people could, could watch on the weekend if they wanted to. Okay, so. So you see, so it kind of looks a little bit like Netflix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like that. So that's something fun that we have. Doesn't work in Chrome. And it doesn't work in Chrome right now. Okay, it so will don't use Google Chrome. Chrome, use Internet Explorer or Firefox. So students would have access to that. If we wanted to yeah. incorporate right. something, they do it for us. Right, yeah. and, and you can do clips yeah. of it as well if you don't want to watch the whole thing. And you go in, there's a little link in there, it'll say embed link, so you drop that link and put it in the class. So you use Firefox or what? Internet Explorer. Okay. The second thing I want to show you is OverDrive right here under eBooks, and um, some people know about this, some people don't, but this is one of my favorite resources, um, just because I like to read. I kind of don't want you to tell people about it. <laughs> I, all the books will be checked out. And, like, and then you have to before. sit on hold. So this is a lot like a regular library, and then it's got eBooks and audiobooks. And if it's checked out, then you have to be put on a hold list, just like the regular library. But you can see that um, it's got all these fun books here, and you can do adult, young adult, juvenile. Um, there are some books in here that are used as text in course that they if they have a list of required reading, but you can pick from this list and read two off of this list. There are some of those. Yes. Is there a, a limit to the um, This one will let you check out three. Oh. Yeah. I just had a good question because earlier we talked about having access to BYU's library. Whenever I try to access BYU on this, ask for you. The BYU Net ID. Which okay, are you using it on the app? On the app? I use it on the app and on my personal computer as well. I can't get on it anywhere. I'm just curious if that was a. So you have to pick the BYU Idaho Library. It's again, it's part of a consortium. Uh -huh. You can see right here that we're all participating in this. So it's a little bit trickier when you're on the app or sometimes on your computer because you do have to log in. So you have to pick BYU Idaho, then pick BYU Idaho again, then put your Net ID in. And and so then you'll get that, I guess what I'm saying is, does that give you access to what BYU has, or is it a Yes, some of these. So you can see, here's the difference. This one right here, Divergent, 
you can just see it just has the thing on it. This one over here that has the A on it, that is BYU Idaho only. So if you see that little A at the top, that means that it's our advantage account, it's BYU Idaho only. Everything else is shared between all the schools. Okay, that's nice. So this whole list might be longer because it's shared between all the schools, but this insurgent book right here, that one's specific to BYU Idaho only. Only BYU Idaho students will see it. Thank you. Okay. The cool thing about this is you can read it online, you can download it to your phone, it'll go to your Kindle, some of them, so there's a variety of different flavors that you can get. Okay. Just remember, I said this yesterday, but you have a doctor, you have a dentist, and now you have a librarian. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask for anything that you might need.